Lord, we ask you in the name of Jesus, firstly, that you glorify your name this evening, that you lift up the kingdom of heaven. And I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you will speak to us, you will provoke and challenge us, and Lord, indeed, you will change us. Lord, we need you to change us. We need you to make us the people that we ought to be. Those who live in this world before men of all kinds as witnesses of Jesus Christ. Help us tonight, we pray, as we open your word, that we might see wondrous things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to turn your attention, please, tonight to 2 Kings chapter 5. Kings chapter 5 then, we're going to look at verse 1 through 16. I'm just going to read it and then I'm going to make some comments on what we've read. <clears throat> verse 1 then says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honourable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valour, that he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies, and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him from his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed, and took with him ten talents of silver, and six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes, and said, Am I God, to kill and to make alive, that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray, <coughs> and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so, when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he said to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go, excuse me, <coughs> go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and went away, and said, Behold, I thought... He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, wash and be clean? Then he went down, and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take the blessing of thy servant. But he said, As the Lord liveth, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. I'm sure reading through that you've got a quite clear understanding of where we're going to go. But it says in verse 1, he introduces Naaman, introduces him 
as a captain of the host of the king of Syria. This is, this is an important man. And it goes on to say that he was a great man with his master. He was honourable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. This is man of no, a man of no small words. He was a mighty man, a mighty man of valour. But look what it says after all that. But he was a leper. He was all this. A man of importance. I want to say to you tonight, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter whether you're high in some place. It doesn't matter whether you're a king. It doesn't matter whether you are some CEO of a, of a corporation. It doesn't matter what you've achieved in your life. It doesn't matter how successful you are. This is the end of the description of our life without God. But he was a leper. That's your name. Not just Naaman. These are all types of things. Spiritual things given the real physical, practical <coughs> application. He was a leper. You and I might be a friend tonight without Christ or lepers. Let's go on. Turn with me, if you will, to Leviticus chapter 13. Just a few verses out of this chapter. Verse 1 to 3, I'm going to read first off. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, or a bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh, like the plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons the priests. And the priest shall look on a plague in the, in the skin of the flesh, and when the hair in the plague is turned white, and the plague in sight be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is a plague of leprosy. And the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. How many good people do you know? in your life, and I'm talking about people who you wouldn't, as it were, consider Christians. How many times have we had conversations with each other, and we're talking about somebody, and we say, oh, you know, this person, such a lovely lady, such a nice guy, really wants to, to do this and help with that. The realities are that this leprosy, as we've just seen, it actually, if you, if, you, if you know about leprosy, leprosy can actually start in a person without seeing anything. It can actually be in the body before there's any marks whatsoever. It can be hidden very deep, starts beneath the skin. So you can be walking around and, and, and you, you might look just normal to the eye. And yet you could actually be carrying leprosy. As a, as, a, as a physical thing here. So this is what this, this is saying here. He looked and it started off deeper than the skin. It can seem hidden. Think about what Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. He's talking about them being hypocrites. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are likened unto whitened Sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. These men were hypocrites. They were trying to show how righteous they were. They wore the clothes. They got the t-shirt. They tithed. All the it says Matthew says he, he tithed all their mint and their cumin. And Jesus turns to them and says, "These you should have done." that you should have gone on to do those things which are far more important. But here you see, this is just a little example. Can't see on the outside. But on the inside, full of dead men's bones, they appear to be something that they're not. And this is what leprosy starts out like. Can't see it. But then it starts to break out. In Leviticus 13, verse 7 and 8, we go on to read these words. But if the scab spread 
much abroad in the skin. After that he hath been seen of the priest, for his cleansing he shall be seen of the priest again. And if the priest see that, behold, the step spreadeth in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is leprosy. We need to understand that this disease, this leprosy, it didn't stay in one place, it didn't stay as a little spot. First you couldn't see it, then you get a little spot, then it grows bigger, then it grows wider. Until you find that these people are covered from head to toe. Almost no part of the flesh is untouched by this degrading and rotting disease. It spreads. And we read in Galatians chapter 5 verse 9, Paul says, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You know that your nature and my nature although it may seem hidden to some degree and we may seem on the outside as very, very pleasant, very nice people, this sin spreads to every part of who you are. Every last inch. There's not one part of you that is not touched by this disgusting leprosy. It spreads. And you know what the cry is? Unclean. Unclean. Where did the unclean people go? They were sent outside the camp, outside the city gates, to go out of the way of everybody else. And that's where, ultimately, without the grace of God, they would be cast outside of those city gates. Think about them in those parables that come and knock on the door. The door's closed. Jesus speaks through and says, Who are you? I never knew you. I never knew you. So we go on in 2 Kings. We have a look at a few more verses. Verse 2 to 4. We read here, As Assyrians have gone out by the companies and brought away captive out the land of Israel, a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife, and she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, he would recover him of his leprosy. How insignificant in one sense would this little maid seem to be? She was brought as a captive. She there. She was there to serve, <coughs> to wait on tables. And yet it was this little maid turns around and divulges the information about the prophet who is in Samaria. So if you're a believer tonight, and you consider yourself insignificant, a little maid perhaps, just think of the lives you can touch by opening up and telling people what you know about Christ. For she was just a little maid and captive and that might be how you feel about your own life. Just little and insignificant old me in the back corner, in my little job, tucked away out of nowhere. And yet, one day you hear somebody's need and you pipe up and you tell them about the one, the prophet, the prophet, not the prophet of Samaria, but the great prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you tell them. And you've seen what happens to this man. You see what unfolds after she... What if she'd have kept her mouth shut? They'd have never known. Never sent a letter to the king of Syria. Never travelled. But because of this little maid, she was absolutely vital to this man's cleansing. It says in 1 Corinthians 1, 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world confound the things that are mighty. Not many noble. I thank God that we are a people here today. No disrespect, but we're not noble. We're not dukes and duchesses and princes. What we are is those foolish things. And I, I really want to encourage you tonight 
that you can be the answer through the Spirit of Christ to somebody in your circle of influence. Just like this little maid was. In verse 7, go to verse 7. It came to pass when the king of Israel read the letter, he read his clothes, he said, Am I God? to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy. Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. So the letter was sent to the king, the one who had rule and reign over the whole place, the one who people run to for help, and yet look what it says, who am I? Who am I that I have the answer to a man of leprosy? Who am I that I kill or make alive? I heard this morning, God is the one that kills. God is the one that makes alive. We can run to the greatest, to the highest, to the mightiest, and he or she will not be the answer. There's only one answer, and that is God. And this is what Naaman is about to find out. However, he doesn't find out in a way that comes easy to him, as we'll see. <coughs> Verse 9 says that as he came, Naaman, he came with his horses, he came with his chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Look how he came. He came with all of his glory. Why, why would you need to bring everything that you have, you know, the pompousness? I'll bring all my chariots, I'll, I'll bring all my horses, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring more to the front door of the prophet. Did he want to, to show, you know, I'm, look, look, look what kind of person I am, look, look at how much, um, if you help me, I, I need your help, if you help me, look how much influence I'm going to have on all these other people, I, I am an important man. So to see all this, was he hoping that the prophet would be swayed by his greatness? Was he hoping that he'd take notice of him, thinking, wow, this man is, you know, he, he, is, he is vitally important to this nation of Syria. If I don't do something for this guy. It, isn't it interesting that we can try and convince God <coughs> We try and convince him. How many times have we tried to convince God to do something? <coughs> I've tried. Oftentimes we fail because we, we go with our own selfishness. We go with our own conditions. We go, so, Lord, I've, you know, I've done this, I've done that. You see, even in the scriptures, And then in, in, in Matthew 7, did we not prophesy? Did we not heal the sick or raise the dead? Or did we not do all these things? And Jesus again says, I never knew you. Didn't mention any of what he's just said. He said, I didn't know you. Because all he could do was stand before God and say, look what I did. Look what I am. Surely, surely, Lord, if you just look at me. This was not going to be the case with Naaman. Verse 10. And Elisha sent a messenger. <laughs> he sent a messenger. Saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. So impressed with it was Elisha, he didn't even come to the door. Sent the messenger. I don't think Naaman was best pleased. He didn't hold any sway with Elijah. You know, we need to be prepared to hear the messengers of God. Because initially, this man wasn't ready. God sends messengers. God sends people to speak, to tell you and to tell me what we need to hear. But not only that, you've also got to be ready to be a messenger yourself. I 
Again, we go back to the little baby. We see she was a messenger. Here, Elisha sends someone else to the door, doesn't go himself, he sends a messenger. The neighbor didn't take it very well at all. And sometimes we want, I remember, as I think I alluded to this on Wednesday night, I do remember being in places where I, there was a particular speaker. And I remember the time came where it was, you know, come forward for prayer, that kind of thing. And I remember then all of a sudden all these stewards get, get up and, you know, they had a badge on. And there were that many people who wanted prayer that they all start praying. And I'm sitting there thinking, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't want you to pray for me. I, I want that person, you know. As if that one person was the, the key to it all, you know. Naaman wanted Elisha. Naaman wanted the prophet. And he wanted him to come and do something special. Jesus Christ, the true prophet, sends out messengers. Look what he commanded him to do. Verse 10. What was the command? Go and wash in the Jordan seven times. And thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Wash in the Jordan now. Those of us who have been to Israel will know that the Jordan is not really that clean. It doesn't seem to be clean. It looked like it was muddy, it was just, I don't know how to explain it. It didn't look very nice as far as water was concerned. Maybe. <laughs> and over all the years, think of how many bodies have been baptized. Obviously then, the things were similar. It's interesting, isn't it, that this place, which was given to Naaman to go and wash, is the same place that Jesus himself found happily to be baptised in. And yet this man thought it was not good enough. Washing the Jordan seven times. What is seven? Seven is perfection. Seven is purity. Seven is cleanness. Purify my heart, he's saying. If you look at the number seven in the scripture, you'll find that it, it is always about the perfectness of God. And then in verse 11 and 12, we go on then and we see Naaman's reaction when he was told by the messenger of his prophet to go and wash in the, in the, in the Jordan. It says Naaman was wroth. Naaman was angry. Can you imagine that somebody has just given you something that's going to cure your situation and all you do is turn around and be angry? Why was he angry? Think about the Jews in John chapter 6. Jesus is, is, is giving out this uh, this allegoric, allegorical statement about his body. And his blood. And he says to the Jews, You need to eat my flesh, you need to drink my blood. To them, it was anathema. The Jews had this command about the blood that it, was, it needed to be, to be poured away, dust thrown over it. It was not to be eaten. Because the life is in the blood. That's why all their meat had to be drained and completely not to be kosher. You know, we don't, we don't get these things as much as the, as the Jews would, they would have been, what? Blood? They, they, they thought this man was speaking blasphemy. So he says, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Otherwise you can have no part in me. What did the Jews say? What did many of those who were supposed to be his disciples say? This is a hard saying. We can't accept this. And it said about them that they went back to their old way. And Jesus said that he knew from the beginning who were his and who were true to him. And Naaman he was in the same place, he is full of rage and anger. And he goes on to say, I thought 
Verse 11, Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought, I thought, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the letter. How many of us long for that grand sign? That miracle, that, that supernatural thing. Where is, where is the repentance in this reaction? I don't see it right here. He all he wanted was to be a part of some. I mean, he is absolutely wrapped with leprosy. And he's been given the answer. He's been given the gospel, if you like. But at this point in time, he rejects what he's told to do by the prophet. Walks away in anger. You see it sometimes, preaching in the open air. You give them the answer to their problem. And what do you see in their eyes? Rage, anger, hatred. And at this time, this period of time, Naaman rejected the answer to his leprosy. That he wanted something grand. He wanted the prophet to come down and, and get him out. And to do some great sign over him. Call on the name of the Lord as God. And, and something to like come down from the sky or something. And just, just manifest all over his body from head to toe. Just do something. But who was in the centre of all that? Naaman himself was in the centre of all that. He had not yet seen in his heart the reality. No repentance. He was not going to get away. He was not going to stand there. He was not going to have God called down. No. He had to go and watch. That was the answer. And there was going to be no other. No other answer. No, 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 no. He must watch. Now, as I've already said, the River Jordan was dirty. What an offence is the blood of Christ. What a, a stumbling block to the proud. He says, in effect, may I not be clean or cleansed in another way? One not so offensive, one not so dirty. May I not bathe in another river? He wanted to be clean, he wanted it out of the answer, he wanted to be saved, if you like, in his own way. And we find that today, don't we? I don't want to be touched by that old dirty gospel, that bloody gospel, the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't want to wash in that river. I want God to just call down upon me and just zap me with his goodness and change me. No, that's not the answer. There's only one river. There's only one river, and that river is that great river of Christ's blood. That great fountain as we sing in that song. There is no other river. Not a barn or far part. That's the way of calling these rivers. Look at him, he says, Oh, aren't these rivers much nicer for me to go? I mean, can you can you believe this guy? <laughs> Seriously. All he needs to do, and the man says it later, all you need to do is go and wash in the Jordan. But he is angry. Why? Because he doesn't want that way. He doesn't want the way of the cross. He doesn't want the way of the blood of Christ. That old rugged cross, as the song says. They don't want to go that way. They don't want to soak in that. That dirt. And what it is, what he sees as it is. But the blood of Christ is not dirty. The blood of Christ is the purest thing, the cleanest thing. It doesn't stain you in a sense of ugliness, it stains you with purity. Better than any disinfectant, purifies, washes, 
must wash seven times in the Jordan. What can wash away my sin, the psalm says? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, written by Robert Browning. What a song to sing, and what truth. How many of us say, like Naaman, walk away in a rage and rejection on hearing the gospel of Christ? Many, many rage, many are angry. Now let's just read a few more verses. Verse 13 says, And his servants came near. Look who it was again. His servants. His servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. The long suffering and the grace of God that he has for people. This man rejected him, rejected his way, rejected, he sends the blood of Christ, the purest of the pure. But then he whispers into our hearts, and sometimes, as it was in this case, by those who are close to us. Bid thee, he says. How as proud men we desire to have a great hand and a part in our salvation. And he said, if, if the prophet had said, Bid thee do, if I ask you to do something, would you not have done it? We want a hand in our salvation. But then he says, how much rather then? When all he says that you have to do is go down, wash, and be clean. He didn't bid him to do anything in that sense of himself. He just said you need to go and you need to wash. You need to wash. Wash in the blood. Wash in the great fountain. How much it is greater? How much is the work of Christ greater? Our Lord draws us to the fountain of his blood, to his atoning work on the cross, calling us to wash and be clean. And you know when we wash, and when we wash as we are told to wash, we are bid to come to Christ with all of our leprosy from head to foot, told to wash in that great Jordan. And when we do, as it says at the end of this verse, 15, 14, sorry. When he did this, when he did this, he was clean. Flesh, like that of a little child. And it says, and he was clean. Let me tell you something. When you're washing that blood of Christ, when you truly come in repentance to Christ Jesus and you wash in that great river, you are clean. That's just like a child. No leprosy there to be seen, because his blood is the only cure for that great leprosy of sin. He goes on then to say, Now I know. Now I know. That there is no other God but him that is in Israel. Now I know. By experience he knows. By acquaintance he knows. Like Paul on the road to Damascus. Not by fact. But by experience. By relationship. The revelation of God to man. He says, Now I know there is no God in all the earth. But in Israel, 
There is. What he's saying is there is but one God. Where before he searched his rebellious heart for better ways to be green. Better ways. More grandiose according to his worldly standing and status. But he had to be humble, didn't he? You have to be humble, just like every single person in this room, if you know Christ, to be humble. Had to be brought low. Had to be brought to understand that there is but one river. You can't choose the way you're going to be saved. You've got to come my way. And you need to be humble. And you need to be brought to repentance. And you need to be brought to obedience. And what did he do? He came to that. He went down to the river. His heart has changed. He found that there was no other way. His heart was touched with repentance and he went and he obeyed the prophet and he went and bathed in the Jordan seven times and what happened was that this man was clean. He was a new creation. And you can see that by the change of his speech. Initially he came down in all his glory, his chariots, his horses. And then it says in verse 15, he returned to the man of God. <clears throat> he and all his company came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know. There's been a day as there for all of us, I hope. And if there hasn't, I pray that this day is the day, that this is the day that you say, Now I know. Now I know. That there is but one God in all of Israel. I pray, he says, take the blessing of thy servant. This new creation in Christ. But then he says, take the blessing. Take the blessing from me. But what does the man of God say after he urged him to take the blessing? He says, I will receive none. Why? Because the gospel is free. The gospel is free not because it's cheap, not because it's on some outdated shelf with this yellow sticker on, it says reduced. It's free because it's so expensive. It's free because the cost is so high that we can't attain all that it would cost. In fact, there is no other cost that we could pay. So it lends it then to say that it has to be free. It has to be given by the grace of God because there is nothing. You can come with all your chariots, you can come with all your horses, you can come with all your wealth and your treasure chests and your camels and your trinkets. But the prophet, the true prophet, will turn you away and say, I will receive none. This is the free gift that's in Christ Jesus and Him alone. This is the river. So I want to say to you tonight, if you're not born again of the Spirit of Jesus Christ and you have been convicted of your sin, please don't try and run to another river. Please don't try and argue with God and ask Him to take you to another place, a better place, a more easier place. I want to tell you, the gospel of Jesus Christ, although it may seem like a bloody, horrible, violent gospel, it is the way, and the only way. His blood will cleanse the vilest of sins. If you come with a heart of repentance and obedience to the way that he has set forth. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for that river. The song says there is, there is a river. And that river is that precious river of the blood of Christ. Lord, we don't want to come our own way. We come to you tonight in the way that you are prescribed, in the way that you have set forth. And that is the only way, which is through Jesus Christ, your Son. And I pray, Lord God, for anybody in this room tonight who although may have been in church for years, 
that may not have ever come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I ask you, Lord, that you provoke all the hearts tonight. I ask you, Lord, that you would cause those, if they're only unsaved, bring them to repentance, bring them to obedience, cause them to call upon your name and believe and be saved. And Lord, I ask also that there might be those here tonight who have lived, who have who have experienced the saving grace, but have lived away, if you like. Lord, I ask you that you would touch every heart tonight and you would cause us all to want to recommit our lives to you. To see, Lord God, to see the greatness of who you are. To have a desire in our hearts for righteousness and holiness, for a desire for your word, a desire for truth, a desire for separation from sin, and a deepening conviction of the need to know the word, to seek your face in prayer, to intercede on behalf of the saints, and to be, just maybe, that little maid that passes on the message of the great God. Lord, let us see by your grace the unlocking of many hearts and the salvation of many souls. Lord, build your kingdom and build your church, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you.